Um, let me again express my thanks for um, fixing the microphone situation. It's, it's, I feel much freer now. I don't have to hold a microphone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so we'll continue our explorations of um, conformal field theories. Um, and we'll see um, today, hopefully, um, uh, well, we'll be able to, to take a more, well, to, to look at things slightly differently. So let's first recap what I did in the previous lecture very briefly. So um, I wrote down this partition function as a function of some metric and some sources which are viewed as some path integral very abstractly. I said, well, this guy better be diff invariant, invariant under diffeomorphisms, which is generally the case, and uh, well invariant, invariant under well rescalings, which um, I argued, well, I argued that we're definitely, by, by assumption, we're looking at scale invariant theories. And often, um, what you get, uh, for various reasons that Thomas also referred to, um, you get, in fact, a well invariant theory, at least up to anomalies that I have ignored, ignored so far and that I will continue to ignore in, in these lectures. And um, from these two invariances, we found uh, the conformal word identities for correlation functions in uh, particular for correlation functions in uh, flat space. And um, I would like to maybe stress, sell this, this viewpoint a little bit more. So let me say that we found these word identities including all the contact terms. And um, we found them on basically uh, any background. Um, G mu nu, basically any manifold M and background G mu nu, but background metric G mu nu. And um, that's why I kind of like this prescription um, because there are no, there are sometimes you find people being confused about where do the contact terms come from, what happens, and here the contact terms are completely manifest. They just show up if you carefully take the, if you start with this viewpoint and you're just careful, then uh, you can derive all the, all the subtleties in the, in the word identities. Uh, very easily. And so if you have other situations where you'd like to understand the word identities, there's been some recent work on, uh, for example, boundary conformal field theories where people would like to understand these things, including all the contact terms, then this is a super nice starting point. You start with some abstract path integral and you just manipulate your way um, <coughs> to, to the word identities. So that's why I like this prescription and why I started with it. Then, of course, um, from the word identities, we found in particular that the two-point functions of two primary scalar operators um, <coughs> had this wonderful form. So uh, delta 1, delta 2, uh, some coefficient c12, and then we had x minus y to the 2 delta 1. Um, <coughs> and from now on, let me make these arbitrary scalar operators c delta ij. And then this is i, and this is j, and this is i, uh, i, j. From now on, I will set uh, c i j to delta i j by a suitable choice of normalization. And here again, I'm assuming something. I'm assuming that this matrix can be diagonalized, and that with suitable rescalings, I can get it to the form of delta i j. That's not obvious. It follows from unitarity. Just as an, another sort of hidden assumption that I made in the previous um, um, lecture is that the deltas are real um, and that the, uh, uh, that the action of dilatations can be diagonalized when it acts on local operators. So there are two sort of non-trivial statements hidden in this uh, equation already. And in this lecture, hopefully, I'll get to prove both of them. So um, if not, then please remind me, like as one of you did. Um, in the previous lecture. Um, these word identities were very general differential equations for correlation functions. This is a two-point function of scalar operators. As it happens, you can do more. Um, I think I already wrote down the three-point function 
of three primary scalar operators um, by the Ward identities is fixed in terms of a single number, x12 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. And then there are two more per permutations since I wrote it down. I think I wrote it down in the previous lecture, so, uh, um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to write down everything in detail. And this x12, I'll use this a lot. It's just x1 minus x2, obviously. But since I'll be using it a lot, let me write it out again. Um, you can take any primary operator or, or um, any primary operator and use these conformal word identities compute correlation functions. You can do, for example, a two-point function of vector operators and the conformal word identities. Again, fix it up to normalization coefficient to be something like x mu x nu over x squared over x to the 2 delta of this operator. So again, very easy, and just, just goes to show that basically the two-point functions are all fixed. They're not as simple as the scalar guy. Um, oh, let me put the second point at zero. But um, they're fixed. There's, there's no question in a conformal field theory about the functional form of the two-point functions. In fact, um, for a general uh, tensor operator, it may be good to know so let me write uh, A for a, a general a tensor index or, or even spinner index, so SOD representation. You again find that there is exactly one allowed tensor structure. In fact, there's only one um, if, if A and B transform in, in conjugate representations. Otherwise, there's nothing that you can write down. It depends on X. Just like this thing, there's an overall coefficient, and then there's the perennial factor, 1 over x to the 2 delta. So this TAB is just um, a unique tensor structure. So what I want to stress with this is that two-point functions are really determined up to a single coefficient. It's not like there are three or four possible ways of contracting the indices. In a conformal field theory, there's always one, one way to contract the indices. At most one, maybe zero. For example, if I take a two-point function of a scalar and a vector, and they're both primary, there is zero coefficients, and that two-point function is always uh, zero. Um, there are a few more three-point functions that we'll get to later, but it's getting boring. So um, let me not do details. Um, so let's take three general tensors. Maybe this is good to know. What does a three-point function of three general tensors look like? Well, um, here, as it happens, there's not a un always a unique t a tensor structure. So there could be several. But these are just SOD representations. You just have to find um, <coughs> um, effectively the singlet. Um, I mean, you have the x, y, z, so it's a bit more subtle than that. But you have basically finitely many. Just from representation theory, you have um, uh, uh, tensor structures, again, that are allowed. And you may have finitely many of them. So maybe I should give them a second index, alpha. Um, they depend on x, y, z. Then there is this perennial denominator. So um, x, i, j to the delta, da, 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 and so on. So this denominator is still the same as for the scalar. And now there is a coefficient for each of these tensor structures. So we have lambda, well, we have 1, 2, 3, alpha. So two-point functions are, um, are basically a single number. Uh, Three-point functions for scalars, again, a single number. But for general tensors, there could be finitely many numbers. For example, if you take the three-point three function of stress tensors, and you solve the conformal word identity, or any spin-2 operator for that matter, um, you find three possible tensor structures. And so the three-point function of a stress tensor, in a, um, at least in a four-dimensional conformal field theory, is fixed in terms of three numbers. So again, maybe I should stress this, maybe not, because you already realized it. But these are massive simplifications compared to an arbitrary conformal a quantum field theory. If you just have a 
a general quantum field theory, you have no idea what the two-point functions look like completely non-perturbatively, let alone the three-point functions. Here, well, the two-point functions are basically completely fixed, and the three-point functions are just some simple numbers. So all you need to know are the numbers, the lambdas and the deltas, to fix the two- and three-point functions. So it's already a bit simpler, and this is, of course, the kind of structure that we'll get to use once we get to discuss the bootstrap. Um, for four-point functions, you have, um, you have something new in the game. Their functional form is not completely fixed like here. For four-point functions, I can, if you give me four points in the plane, I can build this object. Let me call it u, x12 squared, x34 squared, over x13 squared, x24 squared. And you'll find that this object, if you do conformal transformation, so infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, you change the axis a little bit. If you do a conformal transformation, you find that this u does not change. And in fact, I mean, why not take the one that's the permutation of this, so 1, 4 squared, x2, 3 squared, x1, 3 squared, x2, 4 squared. Um, this guy also does not change. So if I have a four-point function, and let me for simplicity just look at the four-point function of identical scalars, then um, I can have some arbitrary function, let me call it g, of these u and v. And conformal symmetry in itself tells me almost nothing about this function, what it could be. It's just some function of u and v. And then we need to sort of take care of the general structure. For example, on the rescalings, we want, we want the thing to have the correct dilatation weight so that all can be taken care of by a simple prefactor in this case, which is just this. And this is as far as the conformal word identities can carry you, um, when, uh, you discuss, when you look at four-point functions. Um, so this G is in principle arbitrary. Of course, if these guys were tensorial operators, there would be a finite number of tensor structures. And for each of these tensor structures, I would now not have a number like I had here. I would have an arbitrary function G of U and V. So things would get a bit... Um, uh, you would have several functions, g of u and v. In principle, it's arbitrary, except in this case, um, I took the nice example where all the operators are identical, so there better is some symmetry. If I swap x1 and x2 here, on the left I do nothing. Here, um, I, let's see what I do. Um, I swap x12, so uh, here the x12, the prefactor doesn't change. Here, in the numerator, I don't change anything. But here, I change uh, x13 goes to x23, and x24 goes to x14. So basically, we see that g of uv goes to g, and u goes basically to u over v, and I think v goes to 1 over v, so something like this. So OK, the, there's, there's a little bit of a symmetry for this, this correlation function, because I, I happen to have picked identical operators. And similarly, you can show that um, if you swap, for example, operators, uh, what? Well, two other operators. I'll leave it to you to figure out which ones. Um, I think one and three will do the job. You get this constraint. So for example, if you swap one, three, you see that the prefactor also changes. And that introduces this, this extra uh, prefactor in the change of the correlation function. I'm not sure which one exactly generates this because you may get a combination of these if you just swap two random operators. But my claim is that, the, of course, here you have a full permutation symmetry of all four points. And um, um, it's basically, there's, there's no, but you will not get an independent equation if you go through all the permutations for GUV. So um, if, you get, if you're given a GUV which satisfies these equations, it obeys the full set of uh, permutation symmetry. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, Sorry? I have a question. Okay, so this uh, uh, this correlation function are time ordered or not? Um, it's a Euclidean correlation function. So, uh, sure, Euclidean time ordered because otherwise it would not make sense. But, um, I mean, things commute in, in Euclidean signature, so I don't, I, I shouldn't really have to worry about. I mean, it depends on, on your level of pedantry. But if you're, if you're not too pedantic, then uh, things commute at Euclidean at space like separation. And then I don't have to worry about the ordering. OK, thank you. 
Okay, excuse me. Here, here. Yes. Uh, what if there is some tensor index in the four point function? Oh, it's like I said, then there are, so we, we give A, B, C, D, then there are A, B, uh, C, yeah, D, yeah, yeah. alpha, and we have G alpha. So you, I can even do this now, but then, then of course these equations no longer hold, but you get something like this. So can, can this tensor structure be uniquely found or? Yeah, can they, the, they can be, the, there's an, I mean, of course you can choose a, a suitable basis, just like here, you have to choose some basis, but the set of tensor structures is a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what, what would be the case for uh, Lorentzian? Lorentzian signature? Yes, yes, uh, because um, we'll, we'll get to the Lorentzian signature by analytic continuation of the Euclidean, so there's no... Um, no I mean, we have to do this uh, analytic continuation to, apart from this calculation. Yeah. I mean, these tensor structures are really easy. They're like x mu, x, x nu over x squared, something like this, uh, the two-point function of vectors, this one. So there's no problem in analytically continuing the tensor structures. There's no problem in analytically continuing these denominators. Um, and as it happens, you can show, we'll get there. There's no problem in continuing this either. So, so another thing, uh, uh, what will be the value of alpha? I mean, for any, like, uh, in general case, in point, so what will be the number of alpha? How do you compute it? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a representation theory exercise. But, okay, so um, uh, now how does it depend on n? If I have n, n number of n point function? If it depends on what kind of index A is, right? If a uh, is yeah, a, if I take vectors, for example. Um, what can I say? Uh, I, I mean, at the fundamental level, you have a bunch of differential equations that you need to solve, and these differential equations have the lead derivative in them, and the lead derivative part of it has, the, has, for example, the rotations in it, which rotate these indices, right? Okay. And so you have a bunch of equations to solve. Um, okay. you, ha you know, sort of, you factor out this, this, this term. Um, you, you, yeah, you can, you can basically, um, in theory, you can you can try to um, you can try to solve these equations directly, and you will you will probably get somewhere. Uh, okay. It's not so that's sort of the the down to earth way where you it's don't use really anything new. It's it's it might actually be hard. I I, I realize now oh. to do it the down to earth way. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't recommend. This is not an exercise like determining these tensor structures okay. because okay. the proper way to do it, I should say. It depends on, um, is, is, is better. You go to, well, you have conformal symmetry, so you have the conformal algebra that Thomas mentioned, which is SOD, comma, two, or we're in Euclidean signature, so it's SOD, com, D plus one, comma, one, and then there's some kind of embedding formalism where this, yeah, yeah. this symmetry is realized linearly, and in the embedding formalism, uh, there's actually a much easier way to easier determine okay. these tensor structures. Okay. So okay. you need to, I, ca I can give a lecture about that, but then we'll never get to where I want to get. So. Um, the embedding formalism is, is, I think, nowadays the best way to determine these tensor structures. If you have a better way, you should write a paper about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the three-point function, if you just have, let's assume there are let's vectors, like the way you have written for the two-point function. So uh, in the theory, like for the two-point function, you have a metric which has two index, and you have an x mu, x nu, etc. So basically, the tensor. If I'm to actually understand how this T A B C would look like, so is it true that it will just involve x mu, x nu, x rho, something like that? Because yeah, of course it depends on the differences, right? Here I put one one in the one operator. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is for th uh, three-point function, you won't have a metric at least. Uh, because it has two indices. Yeah, but then I can have a metric with one difference, x minus y, and then I permute all the indices and so on. So okay. I think it might be. I don't know. Okay. I, I okay. haven't. Okay. I don't have the expression at hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, this concludes where I wanted to conclude in the previous lecture. I just wanted to throw these solutions to the conformal word identity on the board and um, give you a flavor for what correlation functions can look like in a conformal field theory. I'll stop at four-point function. Uh, you can, um, 
With five points, it just becomes more messy. You can build more of these. These things are called cross ratios, and you can just build more of them if you give me five points. And so you have functions of more variables that you will have to, um, <coughs> that are uh, undetermined by, by conformal invariance. And uh, same for six point functions, you can build even more cross ratios and so on. So this whole idea where I, I started, what I started with was this thing, which was some kind of partition function, which I wrote as a path integral, although I didn't really compute that path integral, I just deduced some abstract properties from it. But it's very much a Lagrangian picture. And so um, what I'd like to do today is um, discuss the Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian picture. Uh, for uh, uh, conformal field theories. In particular, there is a beautiful Hamiltonian, beautiful way to choose a time slicing of your space time and, to, and the corresponding Hamiltonian, which goes under the name of radial quantization. So, what is the game um, that we will play? Um, we will look at correlation functions of the CFT. Um, I can do this in principle in arbitrary background is what I said. The background that I choose is SD minus 1 cross R. It's a thing we call a cylinder. It's a D minus 1 dimensional sphere. So I can only draw three dimensions. So it's a, uh, actually two here. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a S1 and then time. But in general, this, this is just a d minus one dimensional sphere. And the metric here will take to be the standard cylinder metric. Now, the fun part of this is that I can do a diffeomorphism. I can set tau to equal log r. And then my metric becomes d r squared plus r squared d omega d minus one squared all of that divided by 1 over r squared, right? There was nothing difficult in, in that, I hope. So d s squared. And I have the freedom to do well rescaling, so I can just get rid of this. I mean, that's a bit fast, right? Because if you do a well rescaling, remember the sources for the operators change. And if you remember even more detail, you remember that this operator scale. So this well rescaling is not entirely innocent. It'll rescale my operators if they're primary operators. But for primary operators, this is something that's under control and that I can do. And now I just have flat space in spherical coordinates. So um, <coughs> this is the same. It's just another coordinate transformation away to standard Cartesian coordinates in flat space. And these constant time slices in the cylinder um, are, of course, mapped to uh, circles, concentric uh, circles in my two-dimensional picture or concentric spheres in the higher dimensional uh, picture. And um, what else should I say? Oh, uh, so we can, for example, now consider correlation functions on the cylinder, something like this. So we have O2 of tau2, um, maybe some angular coordinates that I'll denote, denote by n, something like this. You can do that. These are primary operators, and I'll be very sloppy with the hats. So um, unless stated otherwise, all operators are primary. Otherwise, I may get into trouble. There was a question. So will there be an r square in the metric after the while rescaling in front of d omega d minus 1 squared? Yeah, that's, better. that's what I need, right? It's uh, polar coordinates. The r squared plus r squared d theta squared. OK. Um, so this uh, correlation function, well, how does it transform? Well, under diffeomorphisms, it goes to, um, so this is on the cylinder. Under diffeomorphisms, it goes to O2 of uh, R and, and 2 of 1 of R and 1. Now, I have not done anything. I've just changed coordinates. 
under change of coordinates, nothing changes. So the S squared here is still the R squared plus R squared d omega d minus 1 squared with the 1 over R squared prefactor. And then I do my well rescaling, and I, get, I pick up factors. So um, I get that um, this is equal to um, Well, after going back to Cartesian coordinates, I get something like this with some extra factor r, which is the absolute value of x2, to the, or the norm of x2, to the delta 2, and x1 to the delta 1. So now I have my two points, and they sit somewhere. So correlation functions on the cylinder are easily mapped to correlation functions in flat space. So um, it's actually very, there's a very simple map. So um, it's just, in some sense, you can think of correlation functions on the cylinder as just a funky way of looking at correlation functions in flat space. It's really the same thing up to some, some factors that you get from the Welby scaling. <clears throat> the Hamiltonian picture that I'd like to advocate is this one, where um, for Hamiltonian picture, I need to choose a time coordinate and I need to foliate my space with constant time slices, and I'll pick this time coordinate, tau, uh, the Hamiltonian on the cylinder. Um, and so in that sense, I'd like to interpret this correlation function as some uh, in-state evolving for some time. There's then an operator, there's another operator, and we go to an out-state. So I might as well write zero, zero here where these are the states on the, on the cylinder. If there's nothing happening at minus infinity in Euclidean signature, you're automatically projecting on the vacuum at both, at the, in, at, at both the endpoints. So we'll, that's how we'll view this. And here it becomes a little weird because you have sort of this, this point at minus infinity where your in state is defined, now just goes to the origin. And the point at plus infinity where your out state is defined uh, goes to goes to infinity. Oh, and I did what I should. Um, I did forget a little bit. Okay, I think I can do it later. Um, so, um, can I do it later? Okay, let me say a few more things, and then I'll I'll uh, start a little interlude about finite conformal transformations that I should have done before this. So if you, your in-state can be defined, for example, here at some initial time, let me call it uh, tau equals zero. So it gets mapped to r equals one. And I can define my initial state by doing some path integral in the way quantum field theory defines initial state by doing path integrals over space, over half spaces. So if I do a path integral here, I define my initial state zero here. And that's in, the, in this picture, which just correspond to a path integral over, over this space. So uh, in that sense, if you do the path integral over this ball here in Euclidean space, on the ball, this gives me, um, well, it's like an initial state. So it's like a bra uh, on in the cylinder, Hilbert space. And, um, but what I can do, of course, if I do this path integral, I'm instructed now to do this path integral, and that'll, in this picture, give me an in initial state. Um, but I can play a little bit with this path integral. In particular, um, if I don't insert anything, then I basically, um, I, like I said, in Euclidean field theory, by construction, this projection onto the vacuum. So um, with no operators in the shaded area uh, inserted, the state that I get is basically the vacuum. But like I said, let's play a little bit. Let's insert an operator, let's say, at some point zero. Then I get a different state because my path integral is different. I get different answers. Um, so 
um, <coughs> with one operator inserted, you get something like O, a state on the cylinder that I will denote by O zero O. So this coordinate here of O, um, this argument of O is the, is the uh, position on the, on, the, on the ball here, um, but it's a state interpreted in the, in the cylinder. Uh, in the cylinder Hilbert space, if you want. And of course, why did I insert my operator at zero? I could have equally well inserted another operator or an operator somewhere else at some point x, and then I would get a different state. So I can get O x zero, also a perfectly fine state. And uh, if this O is non-trivial, it's definitely different from the vacuum state. And why not more things, right? I can insert two operators and so on. So more ops, um, I get something like OX, OY, zero. Also a perfectly fine state to insert in, uh, a perfectly fine state on the cylinder Hilbert space that you just get by operators. So there's a clear sort of vector space of states that I get from local operators. So in particular, if I take this as my defining map, then this is a map from uh, local operators in the CFT to states. And this is half of what people um, commonly call the state operator correspondence, because I would like to argue that this set of states that you get by um, all the local operators is, um, uh, is in fact a good basis for the Hilbert space. So we will see that states can be um, decomposed into, into local operators as well. Okay, um, so that's the in state. You can ask a little bit about the out state also. So the out state could be something like this, like here. And now things get a little bit more hairy because there's this point that minus infinity, which nicely got mapped to zero here, and we understood it in this picture. But the point at plus infinity also goes to infinity here, and it doesn't seem to be quite within reach. But of course, it's just a conformal transformation away from any finite point. And um, to understand what happens with the point at infinity, we need to discuss a little bit finite conformal transformations of, um, of flat space. So let's have a little geometrically, geometrical interlude where we'll discuss finite conformal transformations, which hopefully the aim of this interlude, so it's really something in parentheses, like so. The aim of this thing will be to um, demystify a little bit this point at infinity and maybe also understand these so-called special conformal transformations a bit. So let's do finite conformal transformations. I'll be fast, so I don't write entire words. Um, we had, what were the conformal transformations? Well, we had the translations, uh, the rotations. These are, not, these are certainly conformal transformations. In fact, they're better than that. They're isometries, but they certainly fall into the class of conformal transformations. Um, <clears throat> the rotations, like so, and then lambda, lambda equals one, and I hope you can all, or equals delta, and uh, I hope you can all do the indices for this. Um, dilatations, x mu gets rescaled, and then there is this funky guy, so these were all easy, but now we have the special conformal transformation. And for this, I only gave you a vector field. And um, you basically have to exponentiate the action of that vector field to see what the finite diffeomorphism is. Um, let me give you the answer. You can check by taking the infinitesimal version that you get the vector field back. Um, the finite one is like so. One minus two v dot x. And you see I'm looking at my notes, so this is not something that you need to know by heart to do uh, at least some research on the conformal bootstrap. Um, 
And this is what the special conformal transformation looks like. So a finite special conformal transformation, a translation is determined by a four vector or D vector. Uh, a special conformal transformation is also determined by a D vector. So here I called it A, and for special conformal transformations, it's um, determined by B. Now this is a funny transformation because this denominator here is singular when uh, x mu is b mu over b squared. So you give me a b, I can do a conformal transformation. I can ask where does x get mapped to? Well, it gets to this thing, this function of x and b. But where does the point b mu over b squared get mapped to? That's a finite point if you give me a finite b. This point happens to be mapped to some other point that's not in RD, it's the point at infinity. So that's another reason that we really need to understand this point at infinity a little bit better. And in fact, the numerator is also singular, but the denominator is more singular. So it really does get mapped to infinity. So the way we should really think of um, RD is more like something that you may want to call a conform conformal compactification uh, of uh, Rd to Rd plus a single point that I'm going to call infinity. So the point at infinity is a set with one element. And so this is a set because Rd is a set and I add a point, it's still a set. Um, as a manifold, I'd like to say that it's SD, the d-dimensional sphere. And the way I can think of this is um, using the standard stereographical projection. So I have my R. In this case, it's R1. It's a line. And I map every point in R to a point on the circle, like so. So this is a map from R1, in this case, to S1, but you can imagine that it works for Rd to Sd. And um, it's almost surjective, but there's one point missing. This point is not the image of any point in Rd. And this is my point, infinity. And if I, need to, if I add that one point as manifolds um, or as sets, Rd um, gets mapped in this way. Rd plus the point at infinity gets mapped to Sd. And so Sd is really the natural space to consider conformal field theory on. And if you work in spherical coordinates, you see that there's nothing singular going on with this. These are just transformations on, uh, on the sphere, which are completely regular everywhere on the sphere. So this is maybe a better way. And maybe we should have started with the sphere, but of course we like flat space for all kinds of reasons. So um, in flat space, these things look singular, but um, you shouldn't be afraid of this point at infinity. It's really just an extra point. It's the North Pole on the sphere if you do the stereographical projection. Um, so you can ask, well, what do conformal transformations look like on the sphere? Um, let's, let me say one thing about this. So conformal transformations, all of those, they map um, uh, let's say, balls to balls in, in the sphere. So um, how, how should I say this? Ah, okay, uh, spheres to spheres in Rd plus my point at infinity. So what do I mean with this? Um, this is a bit of an abstract uh, way to say what I can very easily illustrate with a bunch of pictures. Um, I closed my parenthesis there, so I hope I can squeeze it, squeeze it in here, um, because then we have to get moving to other things. So for example, this sphere or ball that I had here in my radio quantization picture, if I dilate it, it becomes bigger. If I translate it, it moves. And in this way, I can basically get um, any other ball in, in Rd. So radio quantization here, the way I've defined it, singles out the origin, but it's just one conformal transformation away from radio quantization around any, any other point. 
with arbitrary size also. But also, um, it also maps does the following. So you can find a conformal transformation. Um, what if a point inside the sphere, for example, uh, like a, a random point inside the sphere gets mapped to infinity? Then this ball gets mapped to a ball that includes the point at infinity. And that'll be a conformal transformation that is harder to understand if you're not used to it in, um, in RD, but um, if you're just looking at the compactification, the sphere, it's hopefully not so easy to see, not so, not so difficult to see. And in fact, you can even get a conformal transformation that maps a ball to an entire half space. And this is again something maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but hopefully it's understandable here. If I have um, some kind of disk here and I do a conformal transformation, I can map it to a, a, a different disk, which is slightly bigger. And um, if I do the stereographic projection down, it gets mapped to this half space. So um, conformal, field theory, conformal transformations, they map spheres to spheres like this. Um, but this image spheres are also spheres that include this point at infinity. And they can also be spheres that are bounded by straight lines. All of this hopefully makes sense in this stereographic projection picture. But my notion of sphere gets a bit extended uh, if I talk about conformal field theory. <clears throat> so hopefully now you're no longer afraid of this red shaded region and um, this out state that I, that I defined by path integrating over, over this bit because it's really just in the stereographic projection. The black region was this, some disk at the bottom, and the red region is just this, some disk at the top. So they're really completely complementary, and there's no, um, no conformally speaking, there's no, there's no distinction between them. Okay, so parenthesis closed. Uh, this was hopefully clear. Any questions? The boundary condition uh, in infinity is is what? Uh, oh, yeah. Good, good point. Um, Uh, that, uh, let's see. <coughs> I think you should not. Um, I think the proper way to do this by conformal transformations is to not impose a special to not consciously worry about these boundary conditions because then, uh, like if you start fiddling with them, so it's really here the flat space path integral with the natural sort of behavior at infinity, that is supposed to be the thing that gives me the, conformal field, the conformally invariant correlation functions. And here it's, the, it's a different path integral, it's a path integral over the cylinder. And it so magically happens that these things are related by conformal uh, transformations. But I, here, what I need to do is sort of do first the path integral, then compute my correlation functions, and then I can do a conformal transformation. And here, also, I do first the path integral, then I can do a conformal transformation to that of my correlation functions. But you shouldn't sort of do surgery on the fields in the path integral themselves and sort of mess with the boundary conditions at infinity here, because that'll spoil uh, conformal invariance. Then basically what you've done, if you've, you've done something very non-trivial um, at infinity. Well, thank you. And of course, again, you can sort of do the compactification, then you'll do a path integral on the sphere. Again, don't do anything special here, and you'll get the right answer. Um, I need all of this. OK, so we have so far uh, a little Hilbert space. Um, 
space of states that we get by path integrating over this space over this this half the cylinder with some um, which I've mapped to this disk and then I can insert some operators um, <coughs> I get I get nice states in my Hilbert space um, we have to discuss a bunch of things and uh, I have no time left so what's on our to-do list Consequence of the Hamiltonian picture. Let's move this out of the way because it's no good. Um, let me discuss the action of the charges on the states. The charges associated to the conformal um, transformations. Um, then I can discuss a basis of the Hilbert space. Uh, and then we'll discuss um, um, consequences. Of unitarity. So we're building up this, this idea of a conformal field theory basically from, from, from the very beginning. Um, what we've done now is we have taken a very unconventional quantization picture, a very unconventional Hamiltonian picture, which I think is completely useless in any theory that's not conformal. Maybe not, but um, it's definitely um, uh, not studied very well in non-conformal theories. But, um, but here we decided to do this. And as a consequence, we have to sort of go back a little bit to basics and, and, and see what in this Hamiltonian picture um, these things are and, and how we can understand this, uh, this, if we can understand this Hamiltonian picture a little bit better. Again, in this radial quantization, I chose this circle. I basically chose the circle of radius one is where I, or the sphere of radius one is where I um, define my initial state, but by dilatations and translations, I, can, I could have picked any point with any, any size. Um, so three things, one, two, three. Um, let's just go through them. So uh, what do I mean with the charges? Well, you have the conformal killing vector field, psi mu, and we had a bunch of those. From that, we get the Noether current. And I basically ignored some of the details of the, I didn't really distill it from the equations that we uh, wrote in the previous lecture, that I wrote in the previous lecture, but the Noether current you can show it's just j mu, t mu, nu, psi nu. Because if you compute the divergence of this current, um, your divergence either hits um, the stress tensor, which is conserved, or it hits psi nu, then you get something that is basically um, the lead derivative of, of, uh, of the metric. It's the transformation of the metric. And remember that for the conformal killing vectors, something like this. It's proportional to delta mu nu. And so if your divergence hits this psi nu, then you basically get delta mu nu. And the stress tensor, you get delta mu nu contracted with the stress tensor. You get the trace of the stress tensor. That's a zero thing. So this is conserved. So um, equals zero, at least up to delta functions uh, that we've derived in the previous lecture. So this is the, the correct current. Um, and so from the Noether current, you derive a charge uh, Q associated to each of these skinning vectors, which is just the integral over sigma, over some hypersurface sigma, uh, t mu nu, sorry, mu, t minus one x, where n mu is the unit to outward pointing normal. And if I want this charge Q psi to act on states in my Hilbert space, there is no blue, there's, there's blue. If I want this state to act on, on, um, on states in my Hilbert space, I pick this, this hypersurface sigma to be just outside or just on top of the locus where I define my Hilbert space. So this will be sigma. 
And if I do this, then this will give me the action of the charge on uh, the state. So uh, we had a bunch of killing, conformal killing vectors. We had p mu. Um, we had translations. This will give me a charge uh, like this. Um, <coughs> we had uh, m mu nu, which gives me a charge like this. We had d, the dilatations. And d is n rho t rho mu x mu. And then for the special conformal transformations, it's the same thing, but I'm getting tired, so I'm not going to write that out in detail. It's just a special conformal transformation. Uh, transformation killing vector, which depends on some b. So, um, well, some, some psi mu. Uh, and this is, this is, so you can easily find that, find that yourself. Um, oh wait, I, I may need it, so, okay, okay, whatever. Uh, minus x squared delta mu nu plus two x mu, x mu. So that is uh, the action of k. So this is, in terms of the stress tensor, in terms of the nota current, um, what my charges look like and they act on the states in my Hilbert space. So of course it does what you expect it to do. P mu acting on a state translates it, and D acting on a state dilates it. So um, for example, um, so let's look at the action on the states. Um, so let's take a simple state, let's take a state created by some operator inserted at some point x. Um, and let me ask what if I translate it a little bit in a direction a mu. So I insert this operator a mu p mu. Um, you get, um, of course, a mu p mu is just this thing. Um, you have an integral uh, over, over sigma. Uh, of, of that thing, um, I use Stokes' theorem to say, well, this is just a divergence of t mu nu um, contracted with a nu over all of my interior of sigma. Well, the divergence of t mu nu is basically zero, except, of course, I had um, O sitting inside there, and the divergence of t is zero, except for delta function terms that we've derived in the previous lecture. So this will give me a delta function times the derivative of O. Uh, the delta function will kill the integral, and so I will get, by the word identities, I get a nu, d nu, O, y, zero. And this is precisely the identity that we derived, uh, one of the identities that we derived in the previous, previous lecture. And of course, um, this was just the action on, on, on the simple uh, O of Y. If you have a state created by multiple operators, it will translate each of them a little bit, and so on. Um, you can find the action of the dilatation operator uh, so similarly, the dilatation operator on um, Primary operator O is uh, nothing but x mu d mu plus delta. It's basically what we had before. And for the special conformal guy, it's a bit more messy and I'm not going to need it. So um, you can do it all yourself if you've taken notes because then you have the right word identities and you can just do the same game and see uh, what. Um, um, what, these, uh, what the action of the charges is. Um, you can, of course, now, if you have charges, they form, they, they are um, 
they generate the symmetries of the theories. The symmetry form an algebra, and uh, you can compute commutators um, to get the algebra of these charges, the conformal algebra. And this is the, the computing the commutators is also not a mystery. So um, you basically insert. Um, so if you want to commute two charges, say uh, Q1, Q2, then that is just on some state psi. Then that is just Q2 on sigma psi, Q1 on some different state sigma prime um, minus uh, sigma, sigma prime interchanged. And where this state sigma prime just sits a little bit outside sigma, so that in this radial quantization picture, I first compute the action of the charge at sigma, then sigma prime, and then I do it the other way around. So this is easy to do. Um, and uh, you can, especially because you know the action of the charges on, on all of these, on these states generated by local operators, and you get the conformal algebra, which I need to write down, or some of which I need to write down. This is the longest. It's also boring because it's just SOD. It's just a rotation algebra in uh, D dimensions. Um, of course, uh, this is all part of the Poincaré algebra. So you know this one also. Uh, you see that P and K transform as vectors. Um, and uh, we see now, interestingly, that P has weight 1, but K, the generator of special conformal transformations, has dilatation weight minus 1. So that's an interesting observation. And then there is this last non-zero commutator. which um, I, I think I can squeeze it here. P mu K nu equals 2 times delta mu nu D minus M nu. So that's just a, a non-trivial commutator, but you can compute it because you know the action of the, of the charges on these operators. In fact, it's a little bit subtle because, um, well, of course, now I have only given you the action of the charges on these kind of states, states generated by a single operator. And the fact that these commutators are universally true um, would require a little bit more thought. What you could do, in fact, is just compute the action of these charges of a charge on the stress tensor, and then you integrate the stress tensor to generate the second charge. And if you do that, the careful way, then you can show that this algebra. Now, interestingly, this algebra is uh, SOD plus 1, comma 1. Um, and it's related by a weak rotation to the SOD, comma 2 that Thomas wrote down uh, for the Lorentzian conformal algebra in, in D dimensions. So I work in Euclidean signature, um, which is kind of um, very convenient for me. So I'll just stick to the SOD plus 1, comma 1. Uh, what else should I say? Um, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me postpone that. Uh, a little bit. Oh, yes, there's, a, that, there's a, one more important thing we should say. This algebra that I've written down is the algebra of charges as they act on the Hilbert space of the CFT, or in fact, on local operators of the, of the CFT. This algebra is also exactly what you, the algebra of up to some signs that are easily explained. Um, this is just the algebra of the conformal um, conformal killing vectors themselves. 
So in going from the algebra of um, conform of killing vectors to the algebra of, of quantum charges in the sort of quantization procedure, um, there is no big new thing happening. There's no sort of different, no change in the algebra. That's not entirely um, guaranteed. There could be small um, deviations between the algebra of quantum charges and the algebra of uh, classical charges. And in fact, there's one uh, place where this is, uh, this is uh, very famous, which is the difference, uh, which is the Fiorazora algebra in two dimensions. So in two space-time dimensions, um, as it happens, there are many more conformal killing vectors. This conformal killing vector equation that we solved, uh, this is the full list of um, um, solutions is co corresponds to these charges in d greater than 2, but in d equals 2, there are infinitely many. You have an infinite dimensional conformal algebra. It's called the De Witt algebra. Then you realize this algebra as quantum operators, but then you have to compute the action of these charges on the stress tensor. Um, what you'll find is that there are small anomalies. You know, these anomalies I ignored because they're unimportant for my case, but in two dimensions they're important. And these anomalies spoil things a little bit. And that um, is why the Fiorazora algebra is different from the, from the De Witt algebra. Um, and the difference is the central extension, the, the C central charge, which, of course, um, is non-zero for any unitary 2D CFT. <clears throat> no such central extension happens in higher dimensions, and so the algebra of quantum charges is the same as the algebra of conformal killing vectors. Oh, great. I can do a few more things. So this is the action of the charges on uh, the vector space of states, and we have in the process uh, found the algebra of charges, the conformal algebra. Um, now we would like to um, organize the states in representations of, of this nice algebra that we found. The way we will proceed is um, As follows. It will be shown, and this is still to be shown, that um, the dilatation operator is Hermitian in my conventions. Now, if you've paid attention during Thomas's lectures, he said D was not quite Hermitian. There were some factors of I, but that's because his D was the dilatation operator in Lorenzian signature, where you have unitarity, and then your conformal algebra is so D, two, and there's some I's in the process. So his D is not exactly my D. And that's why my D is Hermitian, and his, his one is not. But the unitarity is in Lorenzian signature. So I have to, so in order to get the Hermitian D, in my case, I need to take the Lorenzian signature unitarity conditions and continue them to Euclidean signature. So we'll get to uh, the subtlety. But I, I cannot c completely just ignore it. Um, um, my D is Hermitian, but that's because um, I've moved the I's sort of here in the, in the consequences of unitarity. If D is Hermitian at the physicist level, um, we will deduce uh, that, um, um, sorry, not normal. We will deduce that D is diagonalizable, its eigenvalues are real, and um, um, uh, the eigenstates of the dilatation operator um, form a good basis of my Hilbert space. Again, familiar result in finite dimensions. Uh, let's just assume it's true for the Hilbert space here. I don't want to go into, into further details. So the eigenstates of the dilatation operator, how could I get an eigenstate of the dilatation operator well, let's look at the action of the dilatation operator on a general state like so, primary operator. Um, this operator transforms a little bit. It moves the point, if the dilatation operator acts, it moves the point a little bit. It, it, it gives you a derivative, but it also rescales it. This thing, of course, tells you that it's not an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, but I can easily get rid of it by just setting x to zero. And then I have a nice eigenstate of the dilatation operator. So let's start with a state like that. O hat zero uh, on, 
on the vacuum. So that's an eigenstate of the dilatation operator with weight delta. Now I have my charges and I can act on this state. So one particular thing I can do and I know exactly how to do is act with P mu and then I get just D mu all of zero. And I can do that again, P nu, I get double derivatives and so on. And P mu has weight one, so this guy will have weight delta plus one, this one delta plus two, and so on. Um, if this operator is not a primary, in principle, I could also act with k mu, and I get some new state, let me call it O, twil o tilde at zero, which has weight delta minus one. And, um, well, in this way, I can certainly keep going and can add more and more derivatives. In this case, it becomes a little problematic, no? Because you will have delta minus one, delta minus two, delta minus three, and at some point, no matter what delta is, it becomes negative. And if delta becomes negative, then um, um, all hell breaks loose. My correlation functions fall off like powers of delta, but if delta is negative, they increase like powers of delta. So that's in complete violation of, of for example, cluster decomposition. So that's a completely crazy thing to, to have happen. So we want that for all the non-trivial operators in the theory, the deltas are positive. So we should somehow rhyme this with the fact that k lowers the deltas, and the only way we can reconcile these two statements is to say, well, if I act with k a number of times, at some point I must find zero. And so there must be operators in the theory that are killed by these k mu's because they have the lowest possible dimension. And these are then the operators that I can call, again, this k mu o hat zero, zero, is zero. And these operators are called, again, primary operators. So this is an alternative definition of primary operators. Um, you can show in a conformally flat metric that it implies uh, the definition that I gave before, and vice versa. In a general metric, I must say that, that my previous definition was a little bit subtle because there could be other contact terms and so on. For example, if your operator depends on the metric, things become a little bit hairy. Um, so the previous definition was a little, not entirely kosher, and this is maybe the, the, the cleaner definition. Um, the problem with the previous definition was that you have to define what the operator is in curved space, and there could be ambiguities there. Um, in flat space, um, we can have a notion of primary which is very cleanly defined in terms of the fact that it's annihilated by, by K. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, this group being SOD plus one comma one, you expect some generators to be anti hermitian Yes. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, for, for the case of SO, I think D comma two D was anti hermitian in the Lorentzian signature? Uh, right. Uh, so, is it a choice? I mean, essentially what I understand is that you want the eigenvalues uh, deltas to be real, right? So, you are somehow just claiming that this D is Hermitian, but uh, this group being non-compact, you do expect that certain, some of the generators at least have to be anti-Hermitian. Um. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, the hermeticity of these generators depends also on how I contest the theory, because in a different Hilbert space, they may act differently. Okay, but some, some, something has to be anti-emission. I mean, yes, you know. but at this point, maybe I should not have said okay, SOD okay. plus one comma one versus SOD comma two. One. Yeah, yeah, but even but SOD plus that, one Even that is not entirely true, because I can just do a simple um, redefinition of the basis in this, in this algebra. Um, uh, to get um, with real coefficients, to start from this algebra and to, to immediately land on the algebra as sort of d plus one comma one with the right. Yeah, so, so I think is the rationale that you want the deltas to be real, is that the story here? That you want the capital deltas to be real because- Yeah, I've chosen, yeah, D, D is Hermitian in radio quantization. Okay. We'll okay. get there. Okay. Thank you. Um, but 
In radial quantization, the, the, these guys will not be Hermitian, right? The conjugate of these of P will be K. But if you're in flat space, it's it's odd because the P's uh, in Lorentzian signature Hermitian, you add some I's, some of these are Hermitian, some anti Hermitian. In, in flat space quantization, but we're not in that quantization. <coughs> the algebra of killing vectors is just SID plus on common one, right? With real coefficients, so. <coughs> so that's, I think, what I, what I, that's a rigorous way to say this is SID plus on common. Um, okay, where were we? Uh, primary operators are killed by the special conformal transformations. They are not killed by P mu. I can still act on this, so I get something like this. And uh, now I can maybe understand a little bit better what K mu does um, on these other operators that are not primary. Because K mu should lower the dimension by one unit, so what it does here actually, in fact, is that it just goes up uh, one way. Uh, it goes up in this, in this tower of operators. And the way to see this is that if I act with k mu on a descendant, well, sorry, I now introduce a word I haven't said before. So this is the primary, and what you get by acting with p mu, normal people would call it derivatives of operators. Uh, CFT people are maybe not so normal, and they call it descendant operators. And um, so these are the descendants, this is the primary, and what you get if you act with the k mu on the descendant is easily found from this commutation relation. Because you act with k mu on the descendants, you can commute k mu through p mu like so, and then k mu, if you've commuted them enough times, it hits the primary, it kills it, and all you get is a bunch of commutators like this, dilatations and rotations. And uh, the dilatations act diagonally um, here. And the rotations, OK, here I've written a scalar index. If you're careful, you can, you can dress it all up with some arbitrary tensor index. And the rotations act sort of horizontally on the, on the, on the SOD representation that you get. So um, <coughs> the action of the k mu brings you up. The action of the m u nu brings you horizontally, it just rotates all of those. And now, and the action of the dilatation is as written, delta, delta plus one, delta plus two. And now I've given you the action of all the charges on the states uh, in this, in this, on, the, on this set of states. So this whole set of states is closed under the action of the charges and it forms a single, um, in fact, irreducible generally irreducible representation. Let me not say the word irreducible because it could actually be reducible in rare cases. So this is a nice representation of the conformal algebra. Um, so what labels a representation of the conformal algebra we learn? Well, that is labeled by the dimension. Let's just take the dimension of the primary delta and um, the spin of the primary. Um, so the Lorentz quantum numbers, uh, quantum numbers of, well, Lorentz quantum numbers, I can just say spin, and spin of the primary. So if you give me a, a delta and a spin, uh, a Lorentz representation, then and you say this is the primary, then I built like so the whole representation of the conformal algebra from this uh, and the action of the, of the charges as indicated from this one primary operator, from these quantum numbers. So what about, oh, this was way too slow. Um, what about other states? Um, so we have a bunch of states now. They've transformed nicely in representations. First of all, um, 
we have the state generated by the operator sitting at the origin, and then um, um, we can act with finitely many derivatives. But I wrote a few other states. So let's look at states that were not manifestly in this, in this form. They're not an operator or derivatives of an operator sitting at the origin. So for example, you can look at the operator at some point x. This, I argued, was a state in my Hilbert space. How does it fit in that pattern? Well, of course, this is really just e to the p dot x acting on O of 0, 0, because if I expand the exponential, I just get, um, I, well, sorry, this exponential is just an exponentiated translation. So um, <coughs> this, uh, this translates the operator from 0 to x. And if I expand the exponential, I get that this is a sum, n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n factorial um, p dot x x dot d to the n, o zero, 0. So as it happens, this state, operator inserted at some finite distance away, is an infinite linear combination of states of this form. So there's nothing new going on here. It's just um, these states um, are sufficient to capture also the states generated by an operator inserted a finite distance away from the origin. Now what if I had a state that was generated not by a single operator, but a state generated by two or maybe more operators? What happens with that? Well, for that, we need to work a little bit more. So what I'd like in the last five minutes or so to do is um, draw some pictures because it's late. So let's consider an eigenstate of the dilatation operator. So we'll just compute a correlation function like this. We have some states psi. And let me suppose that it's an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, because those states will definitely form a basis in my Hilbert space. I compute the correlation function with some other operators, so I have something like psi, and then O, O operators like so. Psi is, of course, an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, so I know exactly what happens if I act with the dilatation operator on it. And pictorially, what happens if I act with the dilatation operator is I can shrink this little ball, this ball to a, to a very small ball, like so. And the price I pay is just some simple phase factor, essentially, because I just act with an exponentiated dilatation operator. In fact, because I change the point at which I quantize, uh, even the phase factor disappears. Um, but um, that's not important for uh, for the rest of the, of the picture. So I can just shrink it um, by acting with e to the tau d. In fact, I can make this thing arbitrarily small. I mean, I, here I give it some finite size, but I can just make it a very small thing, and then I have my other operators. Now, what do I have? I have basically something that is a very small excitation at the origin and a bunch of other operators. In fact, I can, of course, I mean, the origin is not a special point. So to emphasize that, let me translate everything away. And I get something like this. My special state is here. I have four other operators. And that is basically the same, same thing as what I started with. I know exactly how the charges act on, on this. So I can just, on this, on this correlation function on the state, so I can just do this. and. Um, and this is basically the same observable up to conformal transformations as this. But what is this? 
I mean, this thing, there's some state psi here, but it's very, very small. And so in some sense, it's like a small, arbitrarily small excitation. That's exactly a local operator. And so either this, if you give me the list of, a list of local operators in the theory, either this site becomes a local operator, becomes one operator in the list, or it's something else, but that something else exactly acts like a local operator in the theory. I can insert it at the point and compute correlation functions. So why not add it to the list? So by construction, I'd like to say, well, eigenstates of the dilatation operator, if they weren't in the list, you should add them. And so they define local operators. So psi defines a local operator. So psi, we'll say, is uh, in this in the original picture, it's really just some operator O associated to psi inserted at zero, like this. And we'll define uh, local operators that way. And once you do this, um, there is of course a map now from states to operators. And the eigenstates of the dilatation operator form a basis. So, um, um, so basically, using this map, I can map any state to a linear combination of operators in the, in, of local operators in the theory. And this is then the second half of the state operator correspondence. So it tells you that um, the local operators, if you've counted them correctly, and you've included all of them, um, form, um, in this manner, a basis of the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory in the radio quantization, that we, that we defined in the radio quantization picture. So that means that in particular states created by two, three, four operators, well, they may look very complicated, but, but by using this procedure, by decomposing it in eigenstates of the dilatation operator, I must be able to write also an arbitrarily complicated state as a linear combination of states of this form, primaries and descendants uh, generated by the local operators at the so really, every state looks like a linear combination of states of this form. And um, that's the picture that you should have for the Hilbert space of a CFT and radio quantization. OK, I'm going over time, and you've been bombarded with lectures, so I should really stop here. Uh, thank you very much.